this past week has been the week that we call within the worldwide church the week of prayer. The <coughs> emphasis on obviously prayer and a theme that is chosen uh, for the week. And the theme for this week was faithfulness to his word. The importance of the Bible, the importance of what the Bible says to us, the importance of us understanding and being prepared, the way it helps us to know better the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christ of the Bible. And for this week they are concentrating on the importance of Scripture for the end times. And they normally seem to conclude, you know, um, the week with a passage from the pen of Mrs. White. So this is based very much on um, what she has to say. The emphasis <coughs> is on understanding scripture and our help for the end times and to see us through the end times until that time when Christ shall come again. It suggests that, you know, without that understanding, we uh, will be, as I might say, a bit at sea. But I'm well aware, and I think we're all aware, that there will be people in heaven who have never even picked up a Bible. And there will be people in heaven who, you know, have been too uneducated to be able to read and study a Bible. Um, and it's, heaven will not just be filled with people who have PhDs in theology. <coughs> if that's the case, heaven will be filled with Pharisees. And I don't think that is going to be the case because um, that is the other side. Of, of the Pharisees in Jesus' time knew the scriptures inside out, but they didn't understand them. They didn't know how to apply them. It suggests that staying grounded in scripture is essential for staying Christian. It's essential in the fact that it helps us better know and understand God. I mean, the important thing is our relationship with God. How well do we know God? How, how do we respond to God? Because people have, you know, funny ideas of God because they misunderstand scripture. Often they don't misunderstand it so much, they've never really studied it, they've just gone by what the tradition of their church background is. And as we know, most church backgrounds follow the tradition of the Catholic Church, where in a lot of instances it does not always paint God in a very good light. I mean, one person told Rachel, I don't think only this past week, the only reason I became a, I became a Christian because I didn't want to burn forever. Um, yeah, we know on the surface of it, it talks about eternal fire and fire, and you know, and will burn forever and ever. But that is also the same phraseology that it is used to describe the fires that are consuming Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a good point. They're not still consuming Sodom and Gomorrah, are they? When they had burned up everything that was to burn up, they went out. And that is, as I understand it, the same way it, yeah. So in other words, people misunderstand God because they misunderstand Scripture. They think he's a God of vengeance. Yes, he's a God of justice. But his number one priority is that he is a God of love. And he will do everything possibly, I say humanly possibly, everything heavenly possibly, to share his love with us and to save us for eternity. If we choose to reject that love, then obviously, um, well it does say vengeance is mine, but we will suffer the consequences of our own choices. So it is very wise to 
take and understand scripture as well as we can, but then we will not be deceived. This very week, yesterday I think it was, I'm not too sure why, because I think it was a new something that had been produced. They had a half hour thing on the radio um, referring to David Korash and the Waco um, tragedy of once again several years ago now. And they weren't, they weren't, I didn't mention Adventists at all, they were focusing on him as, as a charismatic person who by his charm and his weight of argument and everything like that, and his claim to understand the complexity of scripture could draw people after him. And um, I think this is uh, sort of the emphasis of the reading here this morning is if we uh, understand scripture the best we can understand scripture and understand end time events, we will, we will not open ourselves up to being deceived. I mean, God is good to us. He, he's not going to let people, he's not going to let the devil, you know, um, <coughs> deceive us just because um, we don't totally understand every last thing of scripture. He is going to give us the understanding that we need. But that is no excuse for us not when we have the opportunity to study scripture for itself, to know what the Bible says so that we can we can be prepared to the best of our, our ability. That's why the key verse from Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Yeah. And my, one of my big concerns is, is not, it is not those that are, uh, you know, preaching and things radically different that is going to deceive us. I mean, if... I don't know the gentleman that should have been here, coming here today, I've heard of, I don't know, but uh, if, you, if you had come in here today and stood up the front here and says, the SEC Executive Committee have decided that from now on we will all worship on Sunday and not on Sabbath. You know what, we would all say en masse, bye away, uh, that is so obviously, blatantly wrong that um, it, it wouldn't even be a temptation to follow it, well I hope not anyway, but it, 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 it's the subtle differences, it's the subtle differences where gradually, um, because the, the devil hates Christians, and he hates Christians even more that are determined to follow God and his will. And he will do everything he can to to draw us away. And he starts off with very very subtle things like that. And um, that is why I'm uh, you know there's a lot of marvelous things that turn up on the internet and on YouTube and things like that. that are very beneficial, and very uplifting. But there are also a lot of things that are slightly drawing you away to one side without you even realising it at times until you are until you are figuratively finishing up in a wake up. But um, it only this week that um, one of our members sent me uh, an email with a, a link to a particular presentation by a particular preacher. I never heard of him so I I mean I did a quick Google check he is not an ordained Adventist. He claims to be an Adventist, but he's not an ordained Adventist minister working for the Adventist Church. In other words, he's one of these um, um, extra ministries. Once again, some of them are brilliant. They reach in parts of the world that the organised church can't reach. They bring messages sometimes of, uh, that uh, we ought to hear more often that we don't always hear. Then others of them are destructive. They draw, they have tried to draw people away from the church. Yes. And in the worst instances, they, they, they try and make out that the Seventh day Adventist church is Babylon. And their mission is to draw out members from the Adventist church 
into their particular organisation, the pure church in their mind. So, so the devil is at hard at work. He's, he is determined uh, where possible to cause as much trouble, to cause as much uh, people to be misled as possible. That's why the emphasis on this is very much grounded on know the scriptures. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive powers of the spirits of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible, for its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. At every revival of God's work, the prince of evil is aroused to more intense activity. He is now putting forth his utmost efforts for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his miraculous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that, that it will be impossible to, to distinguish between them except through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, that of the Scriptures, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Personally, I still have a, a big issue with a whole lot of these so-called healing ministries. Um, are they of God? Are they not of God? Which are the genuine? Which are the, which are the counterfeit? Usually by the lifestyle of those who are leading in these ministries, it, it, um, it reveals itself over time. By that fruit, you will know them. I mean, if you've got to have a, um, a luxury lifestyle, a jet-setting um, lifestyle, perhaps you know it. But, uh, that person is a humble person being used by God. Those who endeavour to obey all the commands of God will be opposed and derided. They can only stand in God and in God alone. In order to endure the trials before them, they must understand the will of God. And how do we understand the will of God the best? As it is revealed in his word. They can honour him only as they have a right concept of his character. And as we've already said, how many people, even within the Christian world, have the wrong concept of the character of God? Let alone the insurance companies who uh, blame every disaster of as, as, as an act of God. Can, we can only honour him as we have a right concept of his character, his government, and his purposes for us, for the world, for the universe, in accordance with what we see in Scripture. We need to fortify our minds as far as possible to stand in the last great conflict before Christ comes again. To every soul will come the searching test Shall I obey God rather than men? I had an example this morning in Sabbath school of um, you know, the instruction to work on a Sabbath. Thankfully, God intervened so that that didn't happen last very long and the gentleman could have his Sabbath off. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have to choose. Do we work and have money? Or do we be faithful to God and lose at work? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defence of the commands of God and the faith of Jesus? Now sometimes even when we are told quite plainly and we'll see the example of the disciples there, because of a mindset and things like that, they just did not understand or comprehend. 
because before his crucifixion, Jesus explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and rise again from the tomb. And angels were present to impress his words on them, their minds and hearts. But that wasn't what the disciples were looking for. They couldn't get their head round it. So they had a preconceived idea like the rest of the Jewish world of the Messiah. He was coming to kick out the Romans, set up his kingdom. This going to die didn't fit their preconceived ideas. So they couldn't get their heads around it. And they didn't, I think, even try. The words which I needed to remember just didn't sink in or were banished from their minds. And when the time of trial came, it found them totally unprepared. The death of Jesus has fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not even forewarned them. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation, and the time of trouble will find them unready. I couldn't help but thinking of some of Rachel's sisters who told us the story before. They were all, in their own way, committed Christians. Most of them don't really even understand about the second coming, you know, was it a secret rapture, is it this and that, uh, or whatever, let alone, you know, in preparation for the time before Christ comes. In fact, uh, I mean, Rachel will tell you what she mentioned to, to some of them. All I would say, God, you are obsessed by the second coming. So it was a it was a minor issue that deserved minor and no consideration in the you know the day to day life. And these were from committed Christians. When God sends to men warnings so important that they are represented as proclaimed by holy angels flying in the midst of heaven, he requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. The fearful judgments denounced against the worship of the beast and his image in Revelation 14 should lead all to a diligent study of the prophecies to learn what the mark of the beast is and how to avoid receiving it. You know, as a church, we were pretty good on some of those things at one time. It doesn't get mentioned very often these days. And this is why I'm so pleased that um, Pastor Michael Walker, when he was here before, has volunteered, and it has been arranged that he's coming in the new year, to go through, first of all, Daniel, and then hopefully following on with Revelation, to open our minds, to remind us, to tell us, I'm sure some of us have never even heard of them in the first place. You know, it's coming, I think, for a seven-week period, seven Sabbaths in a row, a morning and an afternoon presentation, so that we can start to understand, for those of us who don't, um, what is going to happen. But the masses of the people turn away their ears from hearing the truth and are turned into fables. The Apostle Paul declares, looking down to our time for the last days, he says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sometimes if you listen to sermons and things on the media and things, doctrine doesn't even seem to come into it. It's a lot of sound doctrine. Um, but that is, I'm afraid, how Satan deceives and camouflages. That time has fully come when we need to know and understand sound doctrine from the Bible. The multitudes do not want Bible truth because it interferes with the desires of the world. 
Satan supplies the deceptions that they want to hear and they love to hear. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of church councils, as numerous as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus said the Lord, in its support. Satan is constantly endeavouring to attract attention to, to man in the place of God. He leads the people to look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology, dare I even say the likes of Doug Batchelor, as their guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then, by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes of God to his will. Forget that last faith about Doug Batchelor, because I'm sure he's a, a very genuine Adventist presenter. When Christ came to speak the words of life, the common people heard him gladly, and many, even of the priests and rulers, believed on him. But the chief of the priesthood and the leading men of the nation were determined to condemn and repute his teachings. Though they were baffled in their efforts to find accusations against him, although they could not feel the influence of the divine power and wisdom attending his words, yet they encased themselves in prejudice. They rejected the clearest evidence of his messiahship because they did not want to follow him. They wanted to keep the power and the authority and um, their leadership to themselves. These opponents of Jesus were men whom the people had been taught from infancy to look up to, to reverence, to whose authority they had been accustomed implicitly to obey. How is it, they ask, that our rulers and learned scribes do not believe in Jesus? Well, some of them did. The majority of them didn't. Would not these pious men receive him if he were the Christ? It was the influence of such teachers that led the Jewish nation to reject their redeemer. The spirit which actuated these priests and rulers is still manifested by many who make a high profession of piety. They refuse to examine the testimony of the scriptures concerning the special truths for our time. They point to their own numbers, their wealth, their influence, their popularity, and then they look at those who want to base themselves solely on the Bible and they can see a difference. They don't want the Bible truths. Christ foresaw that the undue assumption of authority indulged by the scribes and the Pharisees would not cease with the dispersion of the Jewish nation. He had a prophetic view of the work of exalting human authority to the rule of conscience which has been so terrible a curse to the church in all ages. And we know from history how, you know, um, Satan has used men, nations, churches to thwart the rule well of God. And uh, Christ's fearful denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees and his warnings to the people not to follow these blind leaders were placed on record as a warning to future generations. God has given us his word that we may become acquainted with his teachings and know for ourselves what he requires of us. 
when the lawyer came to Jesus with the inquiry, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life? The Saviour referred him to the scripture, saying, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Ignorance will not excuse young or old, nor release them from the punishment due for the transgression of God's law, because in their hands a faithful presentation of the law and of its principles and claims is there before them. So we can't come to the judgment day for those of us who are intelligent enough and have access to a Bible to be able to read it and say to God, well, I didn't know. We have the opportunity of knowing. We are responsible for our destiny. I can't help but uh, relate to the little incident that had happened the other <coughs> other week. As most of you know, my sister-in-law and her husband have been in India for six months. Um, while they were in India, they loaned their car to a trustworthy person, his son. Rachel was laughing because we weren't trustworthy, he was. Not only did he run up a few congestion charges, which I was able to pick up on and um, warn them about, and I would presume they got um, sorted out because it's on the um, envelope that came through, it's a congestion charge on the outside. So, um, um, but he must have picked up some other um, parking things or something like that. And of course, we all know that the registered keeper, most of us know the registered keeper owner of a vehicle is the one that is ultimately responsible. So, I'm taking it was a parking fine or something, that when they didn't respond and say who the driver was, it came down to them. When they still didn't respond, because they told us not to open their letters, um, they went to court and that escalated the cost and um, there's still no response, no paid up um, then it gets escalated up to the bailiffs to collect the debt well they were been home for a week they had all the paperwork their letters they knew what was happening they would have been seen there because bailiffs don't turn up out of the blue. They send in information first, giving you the opportunity of paying up like the courts do. But they were plain ignorant. We were in India. So it wasn't our fault. It wasn't our responsibility. That didn't stop the bailiffs turning up a week later. By that time, because the bailiffs had to call the, <coughs> the parking fine and then escalated the lag costs up to about £500. And they were still pleading, but we weren't in the country, it wasn't. If they had read uh, things, they would have known that they were responsible for the car and the driver, etc. And it's the same with us. We need, we have the responsibility of our own desti destiny. We can't stick our head in the sand, as they say, and say to God, well, we didn't know. We didn't know we shouldn't do this. We didn't know this and that. When we have the opportunity to, we need to, to know and to put it into practice. Yes, God will bring back, he says, he'll bring back to remembrance those things that were forgotten, but to bring back to remembrance must suggest that we've needed to have known them in the first place. But God is still kind for those of us who have, whatever the reason, through time, you know, a, like the thief on the cross, perhaps a last minute conversion or something like that when we haven't had a, or the mental incapacity to be able to read and study. Um, God knows and understands and he's not going to penalise that for us. But for those of us that are intelligent and can study and can be warned and know, he holds us responsible. It is not good enough just to have intentions it is not enough to, to just go along to what man thinks is right, what feels right, go with our feelings. And it's not um, right just to go by what the minister says is right, because our soul's salvation is at stake. And he should 
we should search the scriptures for ourselves. However strong may be the conviction of these top speakers, however competent he may be that the minister knows what is truth, this is not our foundation of our salvation, not what someone else thinks, what someone else believes. It was a clear pointing out the way marks to heaven that we can check for ourselves in the Bible. We ought not to leave anything to guesswork or to someone else's opinion, even in however high opinion we have of that person. <coughs> we are living in the most solemn period of this world's history. The destiny of Earth's teeming multitudes is about to be decided. And now this was, it was written, you know, well over a hundred years ago. How much more true is it today? Our own future well-being and also the salvation of other souls depends upon the course which we now pursue. We need to be guided by the spirit of truth. Every follower of Christ should earnestly inquire, Lord, what will thou have me to do? We need to humble ourselves before the Lord with much prayer and to meditate much upon his word, especially upon the scenes of the judgment. We should now seek a deep and living experience in the things of God we have not a moment to lose. If <coughs> events of vital importance are taking place around us, we as Christians are in a battle. I mean, we we this weekend celebrating the hundred years since the end of the First World War and the battles that they fought there, hand to hand combat. You know, and it was, it was hearing um, that there was casualties right up to the end of the war because, as it says, if you just set, sit in a, a trench and don't advance, you don't get anywhere and you open yourself up to attack. Uh, but those who came out of the trenches and advanced, obviously, yes, in the end they gained a lot of ground and they did, they did suffer casualties. And we need, um, it is important that we do not just sit back and try and duck away from the attacks of Satan. Because we are on Satan's ground. He is making advances on us. If we don't, if we don't defend ourselves, he will do his best to overrun us. It says, sleep not sentinels of God. The foe is lurking near ready at any moment, should you become lax and drowsy, to spring upon you and make you his prey. Many are deceived, many of us are deceived to our true condition before God. We congratulate ourselves upon the wrong acts that we did not commit and forgot uh, to uh, about the good and noble deeds which God requires of us, but which we have neglected to perform. It is not enough that we are trees in the garden of God. We are to answer his expectations by bearing fruit. He holds us <coughs> accountable for our failure to accomplish all the good which he would have us do through his grace. In strengthening us, but thankfully, in the books of heaven, our case is not utterly hopeless, even though we have not always been able to live up to that high ideal. We have been found wanting, but thankfully we have a saviour who has placed his righteousness at our disposal. But when the testing times have come, those who have made God's word their rule of life will be revealed. 
in summer, there is no noticeable <coughs> difference between evergreen trees and other trees. But when the blasts of winter comes, the evergreens remain unchanged, while other trees are stripped of their foliage. So the false-hearted professor may now be distinguished, may, no, may now not be distinguished from the real Christian. But the time is just upon us when the difference will be apparent. Let opposition arise, let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway. Let persecution be kindled, and the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christian shall stand firm as a rock, his faith stronger, his hope brighter than in the days of prosperity. The true Christians, as we look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, may we, through the Spirit of God and our understanding of Scripture, be able to stand firm. As we said a few minutes ago, I'll just read this paragraph again. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord with much prayer and to med meditate upon his word, especially those closing scenes and the scenes of judgment. We should now seek a deeper and living experience in the things of God. We have not a moment to lose. Time is short. Christ is coming again soon. Are we prepared? Are we ready? Are we making it a priority? Or are we like some of Rachel's sisters? Oh, that's sort of little consequence. It will take care of itself. No. We should now seek a deep and living experience in the things of God. We have not a moment to lose. May God ever remind us of that fact. Amen. Amen.